Our first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Robert Eisenman. He is well known to us here at the CSULB community. He is the department chair in the Religious Studies Department. He has a PhD from Columbia University. He has a master's in Near East Studies from NYU. He has a bachelor's from Cornell University in philosophy and physics. He is a well-known author. He has authored The Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, James, the Brother of Jesus, and The Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians. He is a professor of Middle East religions and archaeology. And very noteworthy, he led the struggle to free the Dead Sea Scrolls and was a consultant for the Huntington Library in San Marino on this decision to open their archives. So without any further ado, I would request Dr. Robert Eisenman. Do you want us to sit down here or you want us to stand up there for our opening remarks? That's fine, okay. Well, I, I didn't realize I was going first. Uh, going first is always, the, uh, always better to respond uh, than to set forth the discussion. So uh, I hadn't uh, realized that I would be the first speaker. But I don't really have anything serious to say about Jesus because since they have listed under Judaism, I prefer to see myself more as a secular Western academic scholar. But I can say some things um, concerning how the Jews see Jesus. But I'd also like to respond a little bit to how the Muslims see Jesus and how the Christians see Jesus. Because that's really my forte, all three. And that's basically what I teach here at Cal State, all three. And um, I want to stay right from the start. I don't think the Jews have a view of Jesus at all. Uh, they don't know who he is. And Judaism is not a unified whole. There is no single form of Judaism that reigns or governs the intellectual situation. And um, most Jews don't read the New Testament. And um, they don't really have a view of uh, Jesus. In the Talmud, which is uh, the more orthodox version of Judaism, it's not the same for some of the more derivative Judaisms, conservative and reform. The Talmud, which is studied carefully by more orthodox Jewish people and scholars, the feeling about Jesus has been basically cut out of the documents because there was a good deal of Christian censorship in the Middle Ages. So whatever the Talmud had to say, good or bad about Jesus, disappeared in the censorship. And they, if they speak about Jesus, it's only through illusions. And the only thing they actually ever say about him, because they want to escape the censors, who might have them up before an inquisition or something, is Filoni Filoni, which means someone, someone. But they never mention his name. There is one negative story about Jesus and one positive story about Jesus in the Talmud. The negative story is that he was born in the second century BC, which is obviously mistaken, and that he was the son, so this is a scholar story, this is, uh, you know, just gossip and negative chatter by people feeling badly done by, that he was the son of a, the bastard son of a Roman legionnaire and a mother. But that's all they know. They call him um, Jesus Ben Pantera. And they say Pantera was a Roman legionnaire. And that's all they say. And there's nothing else about him in the whole town. So that's about it as far as the religious do documents of um, Judaism go. So there really isn't a sense about Jesus. Now, if you look at just what you say, well, this, it goes according to the whole spectrum. Some accept the Christian documents absolutely, and some are even Jews for Jesus. And then there are others who doubt his existence all, all together and think of it as some fairy tale or myth or an anti-Semitic bit of propaganda. 
And I think that most is the majority, I think, think somewhere in there. And, uh, but if you speak about the morality of Jesus, as portrayed in the New Testament, I think most Jews, because it's very much like Pharisaic Rabbinic Judaism, uh, feel that that's okay. They have nothing against the morality of uh, what is expressed there. The problem is the anti-Semitic materials in the which for them are... in the Quran to some I think something to do with the problem because uh, we have the time here in these first remarks at the documents of the period John the Baptist who was appointed by the Romans and he killed John he was afraid John was going to So, Judeo-Christian, in any case, That if you want to find out the historical Jesus, you have to find out the historical James. And this is the problem scholars have been facing for a long time. Who is this Jesus? And this uh, quest for the historical Jesus has been going on for 200 years, uh, even including people like the famous Albert Schweitzer. And it hasn't been solved, and scholars don't agree on it, which is, shows how difficult it is. But I come at it that you really have to go to this other person. And then people, particularly Muslims, say this other person, even Christians say that. Jews, they don't even know who he is. Uh, James, the brother of uh, Jesus, they've never heard of him. Because he's not in the scripture, at least the Muslim scripture, he's not in the Jewish scripture. And he's just a sort of vague person in Christian scripture. And my conclusion is, who and whatever James was, so was Jesus. And when you get into the James problem, which leads you to the Dead Sea Scrolls also, you find that the ethos is very Islamic. It's very apocalyptic. And the key to James is, what's in the Quran too? Uh, over and over again, Muhammad is uh, reciting that you are saved uh, by, by, by believing and doing good works. Believe and do good works. Over and over again. It must be repeated about 30 times to my count. 
That is the Jamesian position in the New Testament. James says, you are saved, we are saved not like Paul says, by faith alone and grace. We are saved by faith working with works. Well, faith is believing. So believe and do good works is the essence of the Jamesian position. It's my point of view that it's the essence of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's my point of view that it's the essence of Islam too. So when you start looking for Jesus, you really have to go aside from Christian scripture. Two other points before I close, because I want to give my colleagues a chance to have a few says in here too, of course. Uh, another thing that many Muslims don't realize is that Muslim dietary law is based on James's instructions to overseas communities. In other words, they abstain from carrion, things sacrificed to idols, pork, and um, I forget the uh, blood or whatever it is, the, the third or fourth thing, uh, uh, um, part of the Quranic injunctions about eating are actually the essence of James's instructions to overseas communities in the book of Acts where he says abstain from blood, things sacrificed to idols, strangled things by which he means carrion, and fornication, which all Islam is against fornication. So these are the instructions James gives, and they, are, they reappear in the Quran. So I, I think that the Quran is the heir to a Jamesian strain of anti pauperism Now, um, finally, um, this, um, this Jamesian strain of anti pauperism which permeates the Quran expresses itself in works righteousness. In works righteousness. Now Paul, which is the Islamic position too, you're saved by the works that go before you, the works that you send before you, strict works righteousness. Now Paul, on the other hand, is the faith man. You're saved by your belief in Jesus Christ. And that's the argument between Paul and James in the Western world, Paul went out. And what we call Christianity is basically Paulinism. But the final issue between Paul and James on this faith versus works matter centers around Abraham. And if you remember for the Quran, for Muhammad, for I I Islam, this also focuses on the salvationary state of uh, Abraham too. So I think that um, Muslims would be very interested to look into the James matter and they would find a lot in common with not only James but what parallels James in the Dead Sea um, Scrolls. And once we approach James, we approach the historical Jesus. The, the final point I wanted to make was on the Gospels themselves as a secular scholar now. I honestly do not take the Gospels as history. Uh, and I think more and more secular scholars are coming t to that uh, position. The Gospels are a kind of Paulinism, that is Paul, retrospectively imposed on the Second Temple period. And that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls really help us. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls show us another form of Messianism, closer to Jamesianism and closer to Islam. And uh, not close to Paulism at all. And I think we get the kernel of both this third way that finally goes into Islam as far as I'm concerned, and that you, or many Muslims in this room, would feel very close to if you knew it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eisenman. And as you heard him say, he says he has a bone to pick. Um, I have one point. Um, don't worry, that will not be an experiment in medical sciences. It is a healthy sign of the exercise you'll be witnessing in academic scholarship. Our next speaker is Dr. George Gross, and I'll give you a brief background. Dr. George Gross is a pioneer in the 20th century dialogue between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He led in the foundation of the Academy for Judaic, Christian, and Islamic 
studies in 1977. He has been the president of the academy since its inception. Together with Jewish, Christian, and Muslim colleagues, he has worked to foster a dialogue between these three faiths in the United States and abroad. He has given dialogue lectures at the World Council of Churches in Geneva and for the Sixth Assembly of the Council convened in Vancouver, in Cairo, and Jerusalem, and at the Vatican. Since 1994, the Academy has been affiliated with the University Religious Conference at UCLA. At present, Dr. Gross is a visiting lecturer at UCLA, teaching the Abrahamic religions in the 21st century and the class of civilizations, with the help of Dr. Muzamil Siddiqui and Dr. Elliot Dorf. Gross, Dr. Gross holds a doctorate from Claremont School of Theology. His dissertation was entitled Foundations for Dialogue Between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He was appointed a Merrill Fellow at the Harvard University Divinity School for Testament Studies and Reformation History. He is a graduate of the Boston University School of Theology and Duke University. Together with Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. David Grotis, he authored the book The Abraham Connection published by Crossroads Books of Notre Dame, Indiana. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Gross. I'm very pleased to be here. And I seem to be addressing marginal Muslim audiences lately. There was an, an event at uh, UCLA in the fall, and Dr. Lee was my colleague in that, along with Dr. Bonner in Halifax, and Dr. Elliot Dorf. My wife studied at uh, Long Beach State uh, for a time when I was a professor in Long Beach. And uh, my Destiny has been to be a college chaplain and then begin to work with Jewish Christians and Muslims. Dr. Siddiqui has been my friend, my dear friend and colleagues for almost 20 years. And Dr. Dorf has been with us now for almost six. And I'm also remembering some conversations I had with Dr. Eisner and it's almost 20 years ago as I remember listening beforehand. The matter of Jesus in a dialogue is to listen to the community of Jesus. The dynamic way of looking at material is to listen. Listen to each point of view and particularly to listen to the community which lives by its faith and its practice. And so I'm sharing with you tonight what you won't get unless you go to church because it's not necessarily studied in an academic setting. But so you may have something of a sense of the pulse of the Christian church and the relationship between Christian community and Jesus Christ, I bring to you certain things. Many Christian Protestants in particular think that the, the worship in Christianity is based on the preaching. And that's been a strong tradition in the Reformation churches of the Lutherans and the Calvinists and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Episcopalians and the Congregationalists. But in fact, must be too close to this. In fact, the culmination of Christian worship is in the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. Those are all terms for the same thing. It's called the Eucharist in the more Catholic tradition churches because of certain words that Jesus said in his last supper with the disciples. He comes from the Greek word Eucharistē, which means to give thanks. Whenever Christians gather and celebrate the Eucharist or Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper, the words of institution are read. The Apostle Paul has one form, and there are other forms of the same words, essentially, in the Gospels. The Apostle Paul writes, And I deliver unto you what I have received, that the Lord Jesus, 
in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, see that's where the Eucharist comes in, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner he took the cup, saying, this cup is my blood of the new covenant, drink ye all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. For in so doing, he will proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Now an awful lot of Christian faith is contained in those few words. Each of the Gospels has what has been called the Kerygma, that is the message. It may be that the message, the Kerygma, was the first form of the Gospel, followed then by the events of Jesus' life prior to his last days and also then his teachings. So the message is sometimes also called the Passion Narrative. Passion in its early meaning means suffering or agony. And this has to do then with Jesus' last days when he made his way, first of all triumphantly, to Jerusalem in what the Christians have termed Palm Sunday. And then after several days in the Holy City during which he gave teachings and also during which he cleansed the temple, he then went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. They fell asleep and one of the disciples brought police to arrest him. Now this narrative is quite consistent among the Gospels. I want to speak for a moment about uh, something that uh, Dr. Eisen alluded to. I've done considerable research on the matter of who killed Jesus. And I want to say what I think about that right at this point in a very important parenthesis. Dr. Dreisman referred to the passages in Thessalonians, one of Paul's letters, in which Paul is saying to Thessalonians that Jews killed Jesus. This is similar to some things said in the Acts of the Apostles. But it does not connect with what the Apostle Paul wrote in his perhaps greatest letter, the letter to the Romans. Romans 11 said, has, has God canceled or abrogated his covenant with his people by no means? And much more would have been spared Jews and others if the church had really taken to heart and lived by that. Because it's my own awareness and belief that uh, the covenant bond with the Jewish people is intact and alive and well. And I can draw that directly from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. On the matter of who killed Jesus, indeed there were Jewish leaders, not all, some Jewish leaders calling for his death. In fact, he was killed by Gentiles, by Romans. Now if we back off a little bit and say, what's this all mean? It's my theological position as a Christian theologian that Jesus was killed by the sins of humanity. That all humanity are engaged in that killing, represented historically by Jews and Gentiles, both of whom were involved. And they, in that sense, represented everybody. That this is uh, 
how it comes forth. I'll have more to say about that later in our discussion period. The message or the curriculum, as it is the word in, in Greek, has to do, as I said, with his last days and following his questioning by some members of the Sanhedrin, he eventually was turned over to the Roman authority to Pontius Pilate. The Christian church historically <clears throat> has not only scripture, but also creeds. The, er the earliest creed, creed is from Latin credo, meaning I believe or I testify. And when it comes to that, indeed in Judaism there is the Shema, Hear O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one, and the Muslims the Shahada, and I, uh, I think many of you know what that is, a testimony that God is one, that Muhammad is the messenger of God. For the Christians, the earliest testimony or creed is Jesus is Lord. Then as the church began to find itself in its own spiritual self-consciousness, there developed actually in southern France in about the second century what has been called the Apostles' Creed, and according to tradition, each of the 12 apostles supplied one clause, there being 12 clauses in the Apostles' Creed. This was used as a basis for people being uh, received into the church by baptism, and later simply as a part of worship. I happen to love the Apostles' Creed. And it reminds me in some ways of the joy that uh, the Jews have in the, the, the music and synagogue worship and the joy that the Muslims have in uh, the recitation of the Quran. So it goes like this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now pause right there. There's not a thing said about Jews. It notes to log it in historically, it was in the administration of Pontius Pilate, and under Pontius Pilate, that he suffered. So I want to offer this, uh, this insight into the creedal history of, of Christianity. In the piety of Christians, well, there are many, many songs. I don't like to sing them anymore, but one of the songs goes, <laughs> Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. And then another one is the old rugged cross. As being dear and precious. So I'm giving you some of the inner piety of, of the Christian faith. When Christianity came to a crisis in the 15th, 16th century, which has later been called the Reformation and then the Counter-Reformation. The, there developed statements of faith out of that crisis. And there's one which is called the peacemaking one that is making peace between the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Calvin and Luther being the two chief figures in the Protestant Reformation. And Lutheran, Lutherans and Calvinists got together and reduced uh, at Heidelberg a catechism, which means is what, what you learn from. And one of its uh, questions and answers, I think, will inform us of some of the inner piety of Christianity. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That's the question. Answer, 
that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven not a hair can fall from my head, indeed that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And the second question, how many things must you know that you may live and die in the blessedness of this comfort? First, the greatness of my sin and wretchedness. Second, how I am freed from all my sins and the wretched consequences. Third, what gratitude I owe to God for such redemption. So I've given you a brief glimpse into the piety and the inner life of the Christian community and the individual Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Muzambil Siddiqui. He was born in India in 1943, received his early education at Aligarh Muslim University in Darul Uloom in Lucknow, India. He graduated from the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia in 1965 with a higher degree in Arabic and Islamic studies. He received his MA in Theology from Birmingham University in England and a PhD in Comparative Religion from Harvard University. He has worked with many Islamic organizations in Switzerland, England, and the United States. He was the Chairman of Religious Affairs for the Committee of Muslim Student Association in U.S. and Canada, and Chairman of the Department of Religious Affairs at the Muslim World League Office to the United Nations and the United States from 1976 to 1980. He has also served as director of the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C., and presently he is the president of the Islamic Society of North America and serves as director for the Islamic Society of Orange County in Garden Grove. He is a member of the FIC Islamic Law Council in North America and a founding member of the Council of Mosques in the United States and Canada. Dr. Siddiqui has widely traveled and lectured at universities and colleges and other academic and religious institutions in Saudi Arabia, South Africa, England, Egypt, India, Pakistan, Turkey, Trinidad, Guyana, Grenada, Barbados, Mauritius, New Zealand, in Mal Malaysia. I'm going to cut the list short. He has taught courses on Islam and world religions at Harvard University, um, Seton Hall University, and International Islamic University in Pakistan, and also here at our very own campus, CSULB, and currently he is the adjunct professor of Islamic studies and world religions at CSUF, California State University, Fullerton. He has participated in many interreligious dialogues. He spoke at the World Assembly of the World Council of Churches in Vancouver, Canada, and has participated in many seminars organized by the Nats National Council of Churches and the National Council of Christians and Jews, which is now known as the National Community Co National Conference for Community and Justice. He is also a member of the Supreme Islamic Council of Egypt and the Supreme Council of Mosques in Mecca. He conducts a weekly religious radio program from Pasadena, and he has contributed many articles to many Islamic and academic journals, encyclopedias, and publications. I would request Dr. Siddiqui to speak on the subject. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the compassionate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. I want to thank uh, Muslim Students Association for organizing this program and also thank uh, Dr. Eisenman, Dr. Gross, who spoke on this and very pleased to be here together uh, discussing this important subject. Uh, Islam stands between these two traditions, Judaism and Christianity. Judaism, as you heard, says there is nothing serious I can say about Jesus. Uh, about uh, Christianity, you heard Dr. Gross says 
that the creed of Christianity is that Jesus is Lord. Islam neither says that Jesus is uh, insignificant person, uh, religiously speaking, theologically speaking, of course I'm sure the Jews don't say historically that way, but uh, religiously or theologically, uh, Islam doesn't say that he is an insignificant person and Islam does not say that he is God or his Lord. Uh, Islam says that Jesus is very important, very significant, religiously speaking, and uh, Jesus is one of the great prophets of God. Uh, there are three important principles in Islam. Uh, those of you who are not aware of that, let me just emphasize this point. Three most important principles of Islam. One of them is Tawheed, belief in the oneness of God. There is only one God. So no one can become a Muslim unless he or she declares that there is no God except one God. We say in Arabic we say Allah. But Allah is the same God as Jews say Elohim and Christians say Allah is the same one, linguistically speaking as well. So there is only one God with the capital G and that is the supreme being. This is the most important principle of Islam. The second important principle of Islam is that God who has created all of us, who is the God of all of us, God also takes care of us as he takes care of us physically, materially, he also takes care of us spiritually and he guides us. So the God, God is the guide, Al-Hadi, one of the names of God, the one who guides. And he has guided human beings throughout history. Not just uh, at one particular time in history, not in only one particular area, but in all world, every place in the world, God has guided people. Wherever human beings were, there was the guidance of God. So there are many, many guides of God, and these guides are called prophets of God. So prophets have a very important place in Islam. Prophet is uh, God, and then after that his prophets. So they are highest, most significant, most respectable beings, called prophets of God. And there were many prophets. According to one tradition, there were 124,000 prophets. So prophets came to all people. As the Quran says, that no community was except prophets came among them. Warders came among them. Prophets in China, prophets in Australia, in Africa, in Europe, in America, in India, in Middle East, everywhere prophets of Allah came. God's prophets came to all people. And prophets, uh, there are some important prophets, or some prophets whose names are mentioned in the Quran. Not 124,000 prophets, otherwise it would have been an encyclopedia of prophets. So, Quran is uh, also a book of guidance, not a book of uh, giving you the names of the prophets and the history, hist hist stories of the prophet. Quran speaks only about few prophets, especially the prophets that were well known among the Arabs at that time. And from this brings a principle, and this principle says that prophets were everywhere. So take from the familiar, and then you can imagine about the unfamiliar. So Quran speaks about 25 prophets by name. It's starting with Adam. If you have this uh, small note, you can look at it. We have the names of the prophets that are mentioned. So there are many prophets who are mentioned. And most of these prophets are common. They are recognized in Judaism and Christianity. Most of these prophets are mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Uh, except uh, Prophet Hud, Prophet Saleh, these prophets are not mentioned uh, in the Bible. Uh, prophets who came in the northern part of Arabia or in the southern part of Arabia. And then Prophet Muhammad, uh, we believe, Muslim position is that he is mentioned in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible, as well as in the Christian Bible, in the New Testament as well. Prophet is mentioned, but this is not recognized yet by our Jewish and Christian friends. So, we'll, uh, we, but we believe that he is also mentioned. So, there are 25 prophets mentioned by name in the Quran. Uh, the Quran speaks about uh, the basic character of the prophets. Prophets were the people of truth, honesty, piety, exemplary personalities. So, they were role models and they presented God's message and God's will to the people so that people can follow them and they lived inspiring life. The basic teachings of the prophets were that they all came to teach Tawheed, oneness of God. 
They did not say that you worship me or you worship somebody else. But they said worship God. So they all pointed that there is only one God and people should worship God. They came to teach God's rules to the people. They came to guide people in their moral and spiritual life. And they were the role models. They came to save the humanity from sin and corruption. Saving the humanity from sin and corruption is showing them the way that if you follow this way then you will be saved. This is the way of salvation. This is the way of, this is the way how prophets acted as saviors of the humanity. Now we come to the place of Jesus in that. Jesus, peace be upon him, is called Isa in the Arabic language, which is very close to the Hebrew and to the Aramaic title, Yesu. Yesu and Isa, they're very close. Uh, so he is a great prophet of God. All Muslims believe in him. You cannot be a Muslim without believing in Jesus. Every Muslim is supposed to believe in Jesus. And to deny Jesus is as if to deny Islam. All the prophets of God, we believe in them. We believe in all the prophets of God. And Jesus is mentioned many times in the Quran. His name is mentioned about 25 times. And he is also called the Masih. Isa ibn Maryam al-Masih. Masih is the same word that is, trans is from in the Hebrew language called Messiah. And in the Greek language is called Christos or Christ. So the Jesus is called 11 times in the Quran al-Masih. And there is no other person who is called Masih except Jesus. Even though other prophets are given the same different names, similar names as Jesus, but the person who is called Al-Masih is only Jesus, peace be upon him. So Al-Masih, the Messiah. His mother is highly honored and his virgin birth is recognized, that he was born miraculously. So virgin birth of Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. Quran also mentions the miracles of Jesus and says that God gave Jesus a special message and this message is called Injil which is uh, called in English language Gospel actually the word Injil is very similar to the Greek word Evangelium so Injil and Evangelium is similar words and English is translated as Gospel uh, he had many honorable names Jesus has many titles in the Quran the first and the foremost of course Abdullah, the servant of Allah. And prophets are called in many places in the Quran, servants of Allah. And the servant of Allah, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, servant of God is not an insignificant term. It's a high term in the Quran. When a person is highly praised, called the servant of God. So take it in that sense. Uh, he is also called the prophet. And Nabi, he is called the messenger, Rasul. Both of these names are given to Jesus, prophet and messenger. He is called the word of God, Kalimatullah, Kalimatuhu, his word, God's word. And by that it means is that his birth was in a special way. The word, the command of God came through angel and was given to Mary and this is the way how was he was conceived. So he was given that title. He is also called a spirit from God, Ruh Min. This is another title of Jesus, that is a spirit from God. Uh, doesn't mean, a spirit here is not means life. So there is a distinction between Hayat and Ruh. Hayat, life, is of course with God. God's life is with God. But Jesus is not God's life. Jesus is a spirit from God. A spirit is a different word. And the Quran has used this word even for angels. Uh, Gabriel is called the spirit, a ruh, ruh al qudus So Jesus is a spirit from God. That means he is he's created by God through this is a special word, through this special spirit that was sent to God. That is the angel was sent. He is called the honorable one. Waji fi dunya wal akhirah. He is the honorable one in this world as well as in the hereafter. He is called sign of God. Ayatam min, a sign from God. And he is called rahmatam minna, a mercy from us. So he is a sign of God's mercy, God's love to the world. 
Allah says, Rahmatam minna, a mercy from us. He is called those who are brought close to God. Wa min al muqarrabin, from among those who are who are drawn nigh to God, closer to God. And he is called the Messiah, as I mentioned before, 11 times in the Quran. And this title is used exclusively for Jesus, Al Masih. Now the story of Jesus is told in the Quran in number of places. This is the style of the Quran. You will not find in the Quran uh, stories are told in complete way in any in place, but segments of the stories are told here, segments of the story told there, just to draw some lessons, to give to inspire people, to motivate them. And this is the way how the story is. But you can put them together and you can make a consistent story out of that. So the birth of, uh, first of all, uh, his mother is mentioned. Even the birth of his mother is mentioned in the Quran. Because Mary has a very high place in the Quran. She called Maryam. And there is a whole surah in the Quran called by that name, surah number 19. It's called Surah Maryam. So even the birth of Mary is mentioned. Even her early life is mentioned. Her piety is mentioned in the Quran. Something you do not find in the New Testament. But you find that in the Quran itself. Quran speaks about that. Uh, so she, had a, she was a very pious woman, she lived a very pious life, she dedicated her life to the service of the house of God, the place of worship, sanctuary. And there she was, the angel appeared to her and gave her the good news. She was surprised, she did not, uh, she, she said, how can I have a child? Because she was not married, she was a virgin, but it was said to her, this is God's decision. Uh, this is the decision of God and then she accepted that but still she was in pain how she's going to face the people what people will say to her so this is mentioned in some detail I cannot go into more details but you can look at that their references are already there in the Quran but then Quran speaks about the message of Jesus because that's most important thing is what was the message of Jesus the message of Jesus was not very different from the messages of other prophets of God Basically the same message. That is, he came to teach people Tawheed. Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abudu. The Quran says again, Hada siratu mustaqim. God is my Lord and your Lord, worship him. This is the straight way. This is the straight path. You see, sirat mustaqim. We recite Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, Ahdina sirat al-mustaqim. Show us the straight path. And Jesus was showing the straight path to the people. So he guided the people that there is only one God. My Lord is God, your Lord is God. I am not the Lord. The Lord of both of us, you and me, God is our Lord. And worship Him. He spoke about resurrection. That people will be resurrected because His people at that time, they, did, they, they denied the resurrection. Some of them, not all of them, some of them denied the resurrection. So Jesus emphasized about resurrection. He emphasized ethics very much. <laughs> The ethics of Jesus that Dr. Eisenman spoke that there is really no problem as far as the ethics of Jesus are concerned. Actually this is what he emphasized. He did not deny the law. The Torah he did not deny. But he emphasized that there is ethics as well. And that is the, that is the emphasis. So in his teachings you will not find much of the legal aspects. But you will find more of the moral and the spiritual aspects. Uh, he is made some changes, the Quran says he made some changes in the mosaic law and those changes were because things became quite, uh, people took it in a very hard way they did not follow the, the spirit of the message so he, he brought some changes, he permitted certain things that were forbidden for the Israelites and uh, Jesus had his followers the Quran calls his followers al Hawariyun the disciples, the pious people, the clean people. They believed in him and supported him. And uh, the Quran also speaks about the miracles of Jesus. Very quickly the miracles of Jesus that are mentioned in the Quran is uh, his virgin birth. He spoke in the cradle, uh, made birth from the clay and breathed in it and became living bird. Uh, raised the dead to life, healed the blind and lepers, he spoke about the hidden things. All of these miracles, if you really look at the spirit behind them, you will find that he is emphasizing that there is something beyond the matter. There is something called spirit. So that is the emphasis in his miracles. And uh, he did not teach that he was the son of God. The Quran says very clearly. And he was not crucified. 
They tried to kill him, but they did not succeed. They did not succeed in killing him, and God raised him up. So Jesus was not crucified, that's one of the important point. And the other thing is that he did not claim that he was the son of God. And Quran also speaks about his second coming. And of course, uh, Quran is, uh, there is a reference in the Quran about that. But the Hadith, which is another source of authority in Islam, it speaks much more about that. Uh, there is a, a small chart that I have made about Jesus uh, according to Christians, according to Muslims, and according to Jews. And I have put 10 important points. And in these 10 points you can see that virgin birth, recognized by Christians and Muslims. A son of God, recognized only by Christians not by Muslims and not by Jews. Uh, word of God, recognized by Jews, by, by Christians and Muslims, not by Jews. Prophet of God, recognized by Christians and Muslims, not by Jews. His Gospel, recognized by Christians and Muslims, not by Jews. His miracles, recognized by Christians and Muslims, not by Jews. His crucifixion, recognized by Christians, but not by Muslims and, uh, not by Muslims, and also recognized by Jews. Uh, his ascension, is recognized by Christians and Muslims, not by Jews. His Messiahship is recognized by Christians and Muslims, but not by Jews. And his second coming is recognized by Christians and Muslims, and not by Jews. So out of these ten things, you will see that uh, ten things that Christians claim about Jesus, eight are recognized by Muslims. And only one is recognized by Jews. And that is that he was crucified. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, at this point, I would like to thank our three panelists. We will be continuing, but I think um, they have given us a very definitive idea of the place and the role of Jesus in each of these three different faiths. And once again, we thank them for being here tonight. So let's just give them a round of applause. I did, I did that so you, uh, the panelists would get a little more energy because we're not going to stop. We're, keep, we're going to keep on going. <laughs> the next part of our program is going to be question and answers amongst yourselves. Uh, and I have allotted, or the student association has allotted 30 minutes for that. So approximately from 9.15 to 9.45, the three panelists themselves will be able to discuss and ask questions uh, um, among themselves. Following that, then we will move to the question and answer uh, to you, the audience. So I will ask any of the three panelists to go ahead and begin and then they can exchange their ideas as they see fit. And also, for the question and answer session for the audience, we will be taking written questions. So if you do not want to ask your question in person, then you can present a written question to the podium here and we will give it to the speakers. Okay. I'd be pleased to start out by... I think that Judaism has a particular problem, or a particular advantage, in that, uh, according to Judaic thinking, prophecy ended with Malachi, and so in terms of any other prophets like Jesus or Muhammad, uh, there's no way to give them a place because prophecy ended. And I think that's a fairness because um, um, when in the early days of Islam, as I recall, uh, Jews were not accepted, accepting the prophet Muhammad as a prophet of God, they really couldn't. <clears throat> and while the Christians in the Roman Peninsula had a compact with him. They couldn't agree on Jesus, but they parted in a friendly manner, even so. I think my, my question for Dr. Eisenman is something like this. In, in our time, in the past century, there have been quite a literature coming out of Judaism, Jewish scholars about Jesus, and I'm really not up on it very much, but I know it's there. 
and that uh, some of it is the effect of claiming Jesus as their own, which I think can be quite reasonably done. Um, so I wonder, if Dr. Eisenman, you could give us some more light on, and maybe sort it out in terms of Orthodox, conservative, reformed, um, current thinking about Jesus. Uh, no, I'm not able to do that, as I told you, because I haven't got any idea what the current thinking of Orthodox reform and conservative is, and I wouldn't pretend to speak for them. Uh, as I said, I am a secular academic scholar, and I think something of what is going on here is part of the problem that I see throughout the campus and in all our courses in this subject. We have one idea that's based on faith, that's based on belief, that's based on theology. Uh, but in a university, in an academic environment, I'm mainly on the side of history. So I like to come at things from history, and I've heard both my esteemed colleagues who I value very highly say things about certain things that they're sure of, and it raises question in my mind always, how do you know? Were you there? I mean, this is taking things on faith. Now, in a religion, in a mosque, in a synagogue, in a church, we do tend to take things on faith. But in an academic environment, we like to build up more um, sterner proofs. So for instance, I heard Dr. Siddiqui say that the Jews feel this, 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 and this. If I went to Jews and asked them this question, as I told you before, I'm not sure any of them would respond in, to those questions in that way at all. Because I'm not, as I said, sure that Jews even know what they think about Jesus. Some like him, some enjoy uh, the stories about him, others uh, are frightened and turn off entirely. But the one point he made that the Jews at least agree that he was crucified. I'm not sure about that either. I, I don't know as they even think that. Uh, the point comes down to, and I think here I speak as a secular academic, uh, that many of us think Jesus is not an historical character. Many of us think that Jesus is a product of literature. That the scripture that we have is literary. Uh, even perhaps romantic novelizing. Therefore, in an academic secular environment, all the miracles of Jesus are dismissed as uh, pious enthusiasm. That's just de rigueur, and it would happen in a physics department, a psychology department, anywhere. So, how do we get the character of Jesus? For many of us academics, Jesus is a composite of numerous persona living in the first century, which is why I told you I came at the problem from a different direction. Now, if you come at the problem from a different direction, then you find that everything represented of Jesus, even the things that are echoed in the Quran, as Muzamil said, are the very opposite of what one finds about this character that's supposed to be closest to him, his very, his very brother. For instance, we hear in the traditions about this brother that he was a vegetarian, that he observed strict dietary law, that he circumcised, that he, uh, that he wouldn't eat forbidden food. But the, but the materials that we have about Jesus all reflect Paul's position that all things are permitted and everything in the butcher shop is uh, clean, etc. Now if you want to go uh, find out where to go to look at this material, you have to go to Corinthians and places like that. So uh, these are very important things and all I can summarize in my position in the end is by saying that many of my students in all of the three faiths that we're speaking about mistake literature for history. And if we're going to do history, 
we first have to question everything and get down to the very bottom of things and start right from ground zero as you would in any science and that is a very tough order particularly where Jesus is concerned where so many fantastic things are said so again I have to part company with both my two colleagues on even the questions they're asking I think our subject was Judah, Jesus in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the subject was not Jesus in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Christianity, and secular tradition. Ah, in academia. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why we are talking that way. We do have to confine ourselves to okay. what the religious, uh, what the religious communities are saying. Was what the secular community say? Of course, we can discuss from that point of view. But the point is that what the three faith communities, Judaism is the faith. And it has its own stories. And uh, people uh, believe in those stories and live by them. Christianity ha is a faith and it has its stories and lives by them. Islam also is the same way. So it is important that what these three faith communities share in this matter, especially this personality, and where they differ. That's what uh, our topic is and that's what we talked about. But, <coughs> but uh, beside that, let's... Uh, let me take one point that Dr. Eisenman mentioned in his talk about, uh, appreciate very much his, uh, what he said about the Qur'an, but uh, one statement that he made is that Qur'an uh, accuses Jews that they killed all the prophets. Uh, that's not in the Qur'an. Uh, it has, there is a reference to وَقَتْلِهِمُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ that is the word that is used in the Qur'an uh, that is uh, they are killing off the prophets but that doesn't mean all the prophets because not all prophets were killed uh, and the Qur'an has never said that so it is there, yes they were, they did kill some prophets and they attempted to kill some but that's not all of the Jews it's very important to keep in mind that whenever the Qur'an speaks about Christians or Jews the Qur'an is very, uh, there is a very careful language there and that is وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَمِنْ هُمْ From among them there are some who say that. And from among the people of the book there are some who do that. And that's what the Quran says وَمِنْ هُمْ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنْ هُمْ دُونَ ذَلِكَ From among them there are some pious people and there are some who are other than that, who are less than that. So that, that's, there is no general statement, sweeping statement that Quran makes in this matter and that's why I want to correct that point. As far as similarities between the James uh, position and the Quranic position, I think it's very significant. I would like to read your book and to, to see that <laughs> what those similarities are. I think this looks uh, interesting uh, because we believe that all the prophets spoke about faith and, and action. So it is not just James' position, it is the position of Jesus, the position of Moses, the position of Abraham, because all of them emphasize faith as well as righteous deeds. So faith and righteousness work together. And that is the Islamic position. That's why the Quran says again and again, as you also mentioned, that Alladina Amanu Amilu Salihat, those who have faith and do the good deeds. And this has been repeated. Thank you. Let me just quickly uh, r uh, say one quick word before my colleague Dr. Gross says. Um, I was quoting Paul really and showing, the reason I cited that is to show that I really believe the origin of that is Paul. And Paul did say all of the prophets. Now I do admit that the Quran is more indistinct, but what I throw back then to Muzamil, putting aside the Jesus and the John problem, which is really fraught with difficulties. First, did Jesus exist? Second, is he a composite character? Third, who killed him? The Romans. Crucifixion is a Roman punishment and so on. The governor is the one who had the power to impose it, etc., etc. How historical are the Gospels? What is the vision of John? So that's fraught with difficulties. Then I throw out the question is, Name one prophet that the Jews killed. They didn't kill Abraham, they didn't kill Isaac, they didn't kill Jacob, they didn't kill Ishmael, they didn't kill uh, Joshua, they didn't kill Nathan, they didn't kill Solomon, they didn't kill David, they didn't kill Isaiah, they didn't kill Ezekiel, they didn't kill Jeremiah. In fact, when I throw that out to name one prophet that the Jews killed, there is a faint allusion to a problem with Zechariah, perhaps. One possible prophet John. out of... 
I, I, I rule John and Jesus out as a, as, a, as a very serious historical problem. I'm talking, that's polemics between Judaism and Christianity, the John Jesus problem. But name one prophet. In fact, you can't hardly name any prophets that the uh, Jews killed. Maybe they didn't treat them all well. Maybe they, that's why I said there is something that needs serious discussion and that was the only point that I really wanted to raise that bothered me personally and I felt that I had a, a right to raise that. So I did. I'm sorry. In the, in the, new, in the Old Testament you have a whole tradition uh, the prophets saying to the Jews and calling the city of Jerusalem you the murderer of the prophets. The Jewish prophet themselves said to the Jews, you the killers of the prophets. Well, so Islam this, was this smart. Is, this statement is already there in the Old Testament. Islam was smart because it didn't translate its holy book in the foreign language. Uh, <laughs> These are interfamily accusations. I would like to remind, remind us all the subject is not uh, what happened to the Jewish prophets. <laughs> the subject has to do with Jesus. Yes, but Jesus is part of that problem. <laughs> That's right. Jesus is the problem. Yes, he is the problem. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> the matter of, of um, faith and works has been wrestled with um, greatly by lots of people and certainly in Christianity, and Dr. Siddiqui gave a very lucid account of how it is understood in Islam. Uh, the former Martin Luther said about the book of James, an epistle of straw. He didn't want it in the Bible. Well, it's in the Bible, so we have to deal with James, as Dr. Eisenman has. I cannot really speak for the Catholic Church. I can hardly speak for my own church because uh, we can't do these things unless authorized to say so. But it is the brief of Christianity that faith comes first and particularly in Protestantism that faith alone saves and then out of a life of faith the Christian does good works. It's not that they're unimportant and there's a great deal of advice about what the nature of these good works are and should be, but they spring out of gratitude to God for what he has done in Jesus Christ. They're acts of gratitude. And that's, I think, the relationship between faith and works in, in Christianity. I am very um, appreciative of this um, invitation tonight because we didn't really have the opportunity to establish a basis for communication except that I know Dr. Eisenman just a slight bit and Dr. Siddiqui, he and I are close friends, but as far as establishing with you the basis of our communication, uh, we didn't have that opportunity. We've often done lectures to establish that basis. But even so, I'm really uh, amazed and grateful at how well we've gotten along so far. It's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> um, I can recall many instances where, where Muslims have talked to me about Jesus, and they talk to me about Jesus the way Christians talk to me about Jesus. There's a tremendous reverence and warmth and, and regard in their voices. And as if, you know, they sound as if they're Christians after <laughs> This is amazing. But it is, as Dr. Siddiqui explained, the great, uh, not regard, but uh, uh, reverence for the person of Jesus as a prophet of God. And I, I think what Eisenman, uh, Dr. Eisenman is, uh, is explaining that he's coming at it uh, from the point of view of historical criticism, as it's called, I think that it must also be said that uh, theology is an academic discipline, and I was uh, attempting to offer theological insights from inside the life of the church. See, theology comes out of the life of the church, and I think that e the Jewish theology comes out of the life of the synagogue, and Islamic theology comes out of the life of the Ummah. 
it's from within that these academic disciplines sometimes called theology and I think it's Kalam, is it not, in Islam? So we have this and we deal with our reflection on the life of the community and what it holds dear and what it holds precious. So I want to make that clarification because uh, the theological task is, is very great and we cannot ig ignore it because these communities uh, live among each other. Uh, thank God there are no more ghettos in the United States anyway. And Muslims and Jews and Christians live together. They don't live all on one street or one neighborhood. And that's the way it ought to be. In fact, on the street where we lived in, in uh, Adam Hills before we moved to Brentwood, uh, one end of the street <coughs> it was a, a retired general f uh, from the Iranian army. Uh, he didn't discuss that too much. But that's what he had done in the previous existence. And um, our next door neighbors immediate to us were Jewish. Um, and so it goes. And I think that the rediscovery for tonight, it certainly, of the significance of Jesus, which cannot be gainsaid for the human race because so many people have to conjure with him, uh, including Judaism. I think that there is a, a, a history which I want to speak about. Um, the church certainly until modern times is not engaged in anti-anti-Semitism. What it engaged in was anti-Judaism. Anti-Semitism is a uh, terrible uh, recasting of the tensions between Judaism and Christianity largely based on a false anthropology and anti-Semitism. And that's the allegation that the Jewish people killed Jesus. And they did not. And to, to assume that all of Judaism was involved in his death at the time he was killed, or that all Jews forever are involved in his killing, is uh, a lie of the most demonic sort. It's not true. The Vatican Council, Vatican II, and the World Council of Churches both disavowed that line of thought. And it's um, time that we moved on from such things. We have to acknowledge it's been a factor in the tragic history, but it must be laid to rest. And I think, uh, I think I'll mention what, uh, what occurred when El Bialy and I were working together down at San Diego State. Uh, and I say it with all respect, um, it was a while ago, almost 20 years ago, and our Dr. Albiali, before Dr. Siddiqui came here to us, was our Muslim colleague, and Rabbi Leo Abrami was our Jewish colleague. We were all starting out not knowing much about what we were doing with some trepidation. Anyhow, we were invited there, and we met in a gymnasium, an audience about like this, and they had three easy chairs for us, and everybody else sat on folding chairs or pillows or bean bags. It was a very interesting situation, kind of post-hippie, I thought. And uh, the lights were on us just as they are here. The only thing was that uh, the, the, the lights weren't on the gym, so we couldn't see anybody. We hear these voices. And um, someone uh, asking me about... Uh, Bible authority and so on, and I was saying you need to be more biblical and not less and so on and so on. But anyway, the point I want to make is that somebody suddenly said, who killed Jesus? Like that, without any context or explanation. And I was getting ready to speak about it, so I took a breath. <clears throat> and you may have noticed tonight that I start speaking slowly, you know, I get going. I don't... So I was, you know, pausing. And as I paused, uh, 
most of them, they only started reciting the Quran, that section in Surah 4 that states that Jesus was not crucified. Uh, the Jews did not crucify him, that it was made, it, was, it appeared so, but God has taken him to himself. And he recited this in Arabic, followed immediately by the English translation of it, and then immediately, all this is happening within about a minute and a half, he reached across in front of me, which is not exactly a gracious gesture, you know. But anyway, he did, and he grabbed the rabbi's hand and started shaking it, and he said, See, you didn't do it, you didn't do it. <laughs> now, the audience, just like you, didn't know what to make of it. Some of them laughed, and some of them were very still, and some were a little embarrassed, and it was an awkward moment, but it was a very profound moment, because that part of the Quran um, cuts at the very heart of Christianity. At the same time, it undercuts the history of contempt of the Jews. So I have to, in all candor, bring that up and uh, let you know that it was an amazing experience that night. And I think that uh, uh, the Apostle Paul was the one who said that the, the Gentile Christians should not think of themselves as superior to the ancient world, and that's Israel. Let's take some questions. Okay, I think what we're going to do at this time is move to the question and answer session. And again, I'll remind our audience that please be professional, courteous, and polite to our speakers here tonight. Keep your questions concise, brief, and clear. If you have a comment, make it brief. I will time you one minute. Um, and I will not hesitate to interrupt you. And please make this experience a learning and educational opportunity. Um, and I was also given an announcement to thank Dr. Mahmoud Wajdi. Is he here tonight? Yes. Right here. Let's give him a round of applause. He is the MSA. He is the MSA advisor here for the um, organization, and they applaud and thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. And at this time, I have a lot of questions here, but we will also be taking questions from there. But I will start it off by one question that was given to all the speakers. It reads, why is there such a strong discrepancy in the interpretation of Jesus by Christians and Jews and Muslims? And what are the sources to back up each interpretation? Well, you want me to go on that? I'll start then. I think one point um, that my esteemed colleague Dr. Gross was making and that was also uh, touched on is this picture of the Quran saying that he was not crucified, you did not crucify him. I may sometimes misquote because I'm uh, quoting from memory here, so don't hold me if I add an adjective here. I'm trying to get the spirit of the passage. Uh, you know, from earlier texts, we have Gnostic texts now, which are Egyptian uh, Christian texts from the 3rd and 4th century. And uh, we know that there is a Gnostic gospel that says Jesus was not crucified and laughed at his own death. Uh, Muzamil also spoke about um, uh, the birds from clay uh, episode. I think my student here in the room, Ron, you found that in one of the apocryphal uh, Gospels, didn't you? What was that from? Huh? The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And then there is another passage in the Quran. When you do the historical roots of things, it gets very interesting. Uh, there's another passage in the, um, in the uh, Quran uh, that Muzamil quoted about... Well, it goes something like this, that... If God wished to have a son, he could have, but he didn't. This is in Surah 2, the cow. He, he didn't. He didn't. He could have, because it's not beyond his power to, to do such thing, but he didn't. And then later on, all through the Quran, Jesus is called son of Mary, uh, meaning that he is the second man who didn't have a father. That is, Joseph wasn't his father, God wasn't his father, he is only son of Mary. The first man that didn't have a father was who? Adam. Adam. And Adam didn't have a mother either. He didn't have a mother or a father. Jesus is the second Adam in Paul, the person who comes along and doesn't have a father, only a mother. But I might tell you here, Augustine had that position earlier. That's a position out of Augustine where he says uh, Jesus is son of Mary. 
So are, are these, uh, in answer to that question, there's so much you could say, but I, I was saying that one of the things is that none of this is, is, is uh, certain, and one tradition floats into the other. And that's why, I mean, I haven't answered the whole question. There are so many different traditions. I don't want to take up too much time with my response. Why there are so many discrepancies? I don't think there is a need for discrepancy, but I think that one has to go back to some history. That is, we have the prophets of God, but then at the same time, the early community uh, of Christianity, of uh, the community of Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, they did not stay for too long together. Jesus was in Jerusalem and then after that the Romans came and they attacked and there was a dispersion of the early community. And from there many people went to different areas. There was a whole community called the, the that are known to the historians as the uh, Judaizers or the Jewish Christians. They believe very much like what the Quran says about Jesus. But then uh, the, there was an association with the Roman, with the Greek world. And that's why some of the statements of exaggeration came that the Quran says. Otherwise, basically the story of Jesus and the story of other prophets, there are so much similarities in that and there should not be any discrepancy. But discrepancy came because the early community has such a dispersion that they did not stay together with their early sources in the place where Jesus was and that's how the, with, because of the influence of the Greek Roman world that different viewpoints came. Dr. Gross, did you want to add anything? I've been trying, trying to listen and go through a, a whole bunch of questions here at the same time. Um, I think the original question of why, why these, these faiths differ that's what we've been working on all evening. You know, we've been trying to say this is where they differ, with a little bit of why they differ. Uh, I remember Dr. Sayed Hussain Nasser, who's a Shiite, who's an Islamic scholar teaching at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He came out to address the Academy of Judaic Christian Islamic Studies meeting in Claremont about four or five years ago. And the point of his address was that these three religions are each absolute in themselves. And the task is to find a way to reach out to each other even though we're absolute. You know, it isn't... Uh, I think I just wanted to comment that way because there's no... Uh, uh, we don't in the academy hold back or water down or uh, anything like that and we, we try to and by that means we can actually communicate and really understand each other and care about each other more deeply um, okay thank you what we'll do now is we'll proceed I will take three questions from the audience and then I will bring it back um, to the different panelists all the questions that have been submitted they are being given a lot of them are similar they're being grouped by the different panelists and they will answer those in kind go ahead sir I'd like to address this question to Dr. Siddiqui and if Dr. Gross could respond to his answer. Um, it seems to me as if many Muslims have a very compassion and love for Jesus and believe that he was a very great man, I guess you could say. And uh, I was wondering, aside from what the Quran may say, if you have such strong feelings and such love in your heart and some that some Muslims may even speak of Jesus more strongly than some Christians may, then aside from the Quran, why, could, why couldn't Jesus be God? Why couldn't Jesus be God? Why shouldn't Jesus be God? Because God is God. There's no other one who can be God except God. I mean, they, uh, no other human being, howsoever great may be, could become God. Uh, otherwise, people say, you know, that uh, I like cow, so cow must be God, and I like mountain, so mountain must be God, and I like uh, river, so river must be God, and I like so and so. So, I mean, people can make uh, many gods because they love them, so they have compassion towards something. Uh, but Islamic emphasis is that only God to be called God, and nobody else besides God to be God. Uh, Jesus himself, the Quranic position is Jesus never claimed to be God. And actually you will find that even in the Gospels, he never said, I am God. 
this was an interpretation that was given by the people. So we love Jesus very much, but loving anybody should not make us to exaggerate about that person. We love Prophet Muhammad too, very much, but we don't call Prophet Muhammad God. And in a similar way, many other prophets of God, we love all of them, we respect them very much. But uh, it is Islamic position that you have to control your, your admiration. There is a limit for that. Don't make any human being out of your great love and admiration make him God. That's why the Quran says, Ya Ahlul Kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum. O people of the book, don't exaggerate in your religion and don't say about God except the truth. Jesus was the servant of God and the messenger of God. The death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus is at the heart of the issue of the divinity of Christ. The impact of these events and the church's understanding that it was a confrontation with sin, death, and evil um, is at the heart of the matter, and whoever can pull that off and come back from all that evil and human sin could do to him is a victor. And he did it for our sake. Now that's at the background of the uh, Christian doctrine about Jesus and the divinity, but I want to explain something about that. If, uh, if someone or anyone says that Jesus is God, they're heretics. That is not Christianity. If anyone says that Jesus is only human, from a Christian point of view, that is also heresy. That is not Christianity. Christianity is reflected in what is called the Creed of Chalcedon, which states that Jesus is very God and very man without separation. That's Christianity. And I personally get very impatient with some Christians who go about talking about Jesus as God. And I think it doesn't help one speck as we try to communicate and share with our Jewish and, and Muslim friends. But I want to mention this, uh, and, and then in Philippians chapter 2, I won't uh, recite the whole thing, but being obedient unto death, took the form of a servant, did not think equality with God a thing to be seized or kept, but took the form of a servant and was found as a servant, was obedient to death, and for that cause, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now some Christians think that Jesus is the name above every name. Well, that's not what this passage says. It says, the name above every name, in that setting, coming out of Judaism, can only be the YHWH, the most holy name of God, which in later Jewish history was not even uttered. Um, and this, in translation, became Lord. See, from Hebrew to Greek, the Greek used Kyrios or Lord for the YHWH, so it's the declaration indeed of the Apostle Paul that Jesus now bears God's name. And that's the background of a lot of things in some of these questions. Thank you. I would also request that we get as many questions as possible if our panelists can also uh, limit your comments as well. Thank you. Our next... Okay, I'm going to begin this with a comment and then go right into my question. Um, this is also for Dr. Id. Siddiqui. Siddiqui. Sorry. Um, you said that Jesus, a prophet, came to show the right path. And in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, Allah, except through me. So therefore, this statement pretty much 
uh, puts Muhammad and any other prophets at a second to Jesus because he becomes the only way to enter heaven and the only way to be with the Father who you have asserted is Allah the same in all three of the re religions. My question would be, where is Muhammad mentioned in the New Testament? Um, if you could give me a verse. And also, if there is no father to Jesus, you said that he was born of a, mar of a virgin Mary and in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God is the father of Jesus and therefore that is what makes him so holy and that is why many assert that he is also God, part of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So my question would be, if God is not the Father, who is the Father of Jesus? And also, where do we find Muhammad in the New Testament? Thank you. Well, let me take the last uh, point first. Uh, it was mentioned before that Adam was also born without a father. But God but created. But, uh, I'm sorry? I, I feel, I'm sorry, I didn't respond to that. God created Adam, and therefore, in that sense, he's a father. Created. Just as a father creates a child through sperm and, you know, the mother's egg, he, you can say that he has created this child. You know, a scientist and evolutionist would say that that was how it happens. It's a creation of man and woman and sexual intercourse. So in that sense, Adam was created by God and therefore God is his father. All right. If you want to say that, that father in the sense of creator, that's your terminology. But father in the sense of somebody begetting, somebody is generating a child, in that sense, no. God is, did not generate anyone. Lam yalid walam yulad. This is the Quranic st statement. God did not beget nor was he begotten. God is not the son of anybody, not the father of anyone. But God created everyone and God created Jesus also. So Jesus is one of the creation of God and he was created in a miraculous way, in a special way that uh, Adam was created in a special way, Mary was created in a special way, Jesus was created in a special way, we are all created in a special way. So everybody has some speciality. So Jesus was in that sense. The second point is about, um, that is... Uh, Muhammad in the New Testament. You said that you could find Muhammad in the New Testament. Uh, yes, uh, there is a number of places in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. But as far as the New Testament is concerned, if you read the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, you will find in the chapter 14, verse 14, there is a reference to Paracletus. Uh, and that Paracletus uh, is, uh, is an uh, area that a number of scholars have uh, discussed about that. That means uh, it is translated in the, your Christian Bible as the Comforter. But uh, in the Islamic understanding, is, and there is uh, another way of reading it also in the Greek language, which means the praised one. And the praised one is uh, Prophet Muhammad. This is the name, this is the meaning of his name. And then also the number of other points that will make that it could not be Holy Spirit, as the generally Christian interpretation is, that Paraclete is a Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit was already there when Jesus was there. But he said, unless I go, I will not come. And then he will come and tell you something more about me and about the world. And there are many things that I want to teach you, but you cannot take them now. All of these points that were mentioned, this is referring to the Prophet. And so our uh, interpretation is that this is what here that uh, Jesus spoke about the coming of Prophet Muhammad. And then Quran also mentions that, that Jesus spoke about the coming of one who will be the most praised. Someone come after me whose name is the most praised one. Okay. Uh, I can give you more references uh, from the Old Testament as well as from the New Testament. And there are a number of chapters and books written on this subject by those who were Christians and Jews and then accepted Islam, they themselves produce those references from the Bible about uh, the prophecies of the Bible about Prophet Muhammad. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that young lady had another aspect to her question. She had several things going. I, I, we want to honor the, the people who are standing, but I think the matter, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, yeah. is a very key passage in this whole dialogue. And I want to tell you some of my research on this particular passage, which is linguistic. That is, uh, no one comes to the Father except according to my benefits. You know, we worked on, I worked on this some in our, in our book to try to explain something more about the Christian thinking about this. And if we say according to my benefits, then the next question is, but then who is benefited by the benefits? 
and that raises the question from a Christian point of view, what is the reach of uh, God's redemption? Does it have something to do with also Jews and Muslims? And I remember Dr. Siddiqui said, does that apply, George, even if I don't believe it? <laughs> so, <laughs> something like that. As far as I'm concerned, I believe that this statement, and I mentioned that before, I cannot be a Muslim, I will not be saved unless I believe in Jesus. So it is true. No one come to the Father except through me. Yes, we have to accept Jesus too. But in what way do we accept Jesus? We have to accept Jesus as Son of God. We have to accept Jesus as one of the members of the Trinity. We have to accept Jesus that He died on the cross. Or we have to accept Jesus as the Messenger of God. We accept Jesus as Messenger of God. And if you won't accept Him, of course you will not reach to God. Because God has said that. Did you accept Him that way? So in one sense, this statement is, uh, I accept that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, first a question for uh, Dr. Eisman. Uh, Dr. Eisman, you said that uh, James was a, was a vegetarian and some other stuff about him. I don't know what pure kind foods, of foods, pure foods. Yeah, what kind of documentation? Idols, banned. What kind of documentation do we have to, you know, show that he was really a vegetarian? Are you basing your uh, claims on the Dead Sea Scrolls? No, no, no. I'll tell you. Actually, it's very nice that you asked that question. You have more to the question, and you want me to answer it quickly? <laughs> okay. And uh, one sure that's not all your question. <laughs> okay, uh, Sal, so I have one one more question <laughs> I'm to glad you asked Professor that. Ross. Uh, you said that the resurrection of Jesus is the core of, or one of the basic fundamentals of Christianity. And there's two references, I believe, one is in the Gospel of uh, Luke, and one is in the letter of Corinthians, where uh, Jesus in Luke said that I will be crucified and resurrected on the day, uh, resurrected on the third day, according to the Scripture. And the same thing uh, Paul claims in his Corinthians letter. But now I want to see where in the Old Testament does the Bible say that uh, the Messiah or the Christ will be resurrected. Directed. And one comment here to the sister that she said uh, where Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in the Quran, I just want to know also where Jesus is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible says that uh, the Messiah name will be Emmanuel. It did not say his name will be Jesus. Thank you. Well, very incisive question. I would quickly, I, you saw me marking things here. Actually, I was marking all these passages where James says these things. So in uh, Acts 15, he, he says twice, uh, so you see brothers giving instructions to overseas communities, James, the brother ruling, abstain from things sacrificed to idols, blood, and what is strangled, and from fornication. Um, there are two other passages, one in Acts 21, where he says, uh, but you see I wrote you, saying, keep yourselves from things offered to idols, blood, strangled things, and fornication. Now, we come over to the Koran, and I uh, hope I got my things uh, done quickly here, and we find out that, um, well, uh, here, 173 Surah 2, He forbid you only carrion, which we'll find out is strangled things, blood, swine flesh, and thing immolated to another other than Allah. And then in uh, chapter 5, 2, it's even better, Five in chapter five of the Quran, forbidden unto you are carrion, think of that as strangled things, blood, swine flesh, that which has been dedicated unto an other, uh, someone other than Allah, strangled, dead, etc. So it actually has the same words. And then in 16, uh, we have, um, let me see if I can find it for you. He has forbidden you only carrion, blood, swine flesh, and that has been immolated to an idol. Uh, so those are exactly the instructions of James to overseas communities in Acts 15. Now if you want to go over to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the whole thing is things sacrificed to an idol. That's what he's talking to, uh, about. And he says, now, now about things sacrificed to idol. And he starts attacking the Jerusalem leadership, which means James. Know that knowledge, knowledge puffs up, uh, but love builds up. Then as to eating things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in, in the world, as he goes on to attack uh, uh, the position of the leadership. But this knowledge is not all. Some who uh, have conscience become aware of the idol, eat as a thing sacrificed to the idol, even now, and so their conscience is defiled. Anyway, he goes through a lot of this rhetorical uh, flourish and ends up 
Well, these people have weak consciences. They're weak. Therefore, when they're around, don't wound their weak conscience. So, I, since food is a cause that makes my weak brother stumble, I will never eat flesh again forever. And yet in the very next thing he says, in the very next section, he talks about eat all the food in the butcher shops. Uh, everything is clean. Don't raise questions of uh, conscience. And finally ends with body or eating the body and drinking the blood of um, Christ. Well, we've just found that James forbids blood. The Koran forbids blood. So this is why I start to develop the theory. The Koran is in the Jamesian school. It is, and, 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 and the Paul school is the school where we get the communion, which is Western Christianity. To finish it up, the Dead Sea Scrolls focus on things sacrificed to an idol. And like the Koran and like James, they ban it. So there are some really interesting things here. But yes, where the historical information about James comes from, lots of these areas and extremely interesting. Thank you. Next. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask you first. Uh, you do believe the Old Testament is accurate, right? And you do believe that the uh, prophets in the Old Testament uh, spoke accurately? Is that true, Dr. Sadiqi? The, the Old Testament of the Bible is accurate, correct? Some of it is accurate. <laughs> o only some of it? <laughs> some of it is accurate, yeah. Oh, so you don't, you don't uh, believe that... We don't accept everything in the Old Testament, and we don't accept everything in the New Testament. I agree with Muzamil on this point. Okay. <laughs> Very little is accurate. <laughs> but uh, go ahead and say what you want okay, to say. Well, first Maybe I agree with you. Okay. Well, um, the description of God in the, in the Old Testament as uh, the name Elohim, the name Elohim is actually a plural name. Uh, in fact, we see in English the name cherub in plural is cherubim, and Elohim is also a, a plurality name. And uh, we see it again also in Genesis when he says, let us create man in our image. And uh, lastly, uh, in Deuteronomy, when it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the verb saying the Lord is one is the verb akkad, which actually uh, describes a compound unity as opposed to an absolute unity. And this is the same compound unity described in Genesis when Adam and Eve are married and it says they become one flesh. It's the same as um, prophecies like of the Messiah. That, uh, in fact, the Messiah is prophesied that he would be God himself. And uh, What's your question? Yeah. <laughs> I just, let me just say this one last verse. In Isaiah 9, 6, 9, 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's so, what my mother said about me. <laughs> Definitely dealing with scholars here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask the question, um, since uh, God is so blatantly portrayed as a plurality here in the Old Testament, and the Messiah, who you admit is Jesus, is also described as being God himself in the Old Testament, uh, what's your answer to those things? Very brief answer that is that um, sometimes the word plural is used for majesty, for greatness, for kingdom. And that's we have that in the Quran also. In the Quran, is sometimes God speaks first person, in the first person plural, and sometimes first person singular. But God is never referred to in the Quran as a second person plural, or as third person plural. God is never called they, or you in the plural, it's only thou, and thine, in that sense. But sometimes says, we, when he speaks about his glory, his greatness, in that sense. So I think that uh, the plural of Elohim is the plural of majesty, maybe in that sense. But not that God is a compound being of a collectivity. It's, God is not an association. I mean, uh, God is a God, is by himself. And Ahad, in the Arabic language, means the unique one. Qul Allahu Ahad. There is no one likened to him. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the floor and then I'm going to go to the written questions. But before I get to you, I do have one request from this side. Since the brother does have a foot injury, he would like to speak from this side. Uh, I want to make just remarks. Thank you. Oh. I'll come up here. 
Thank you. Um, a couple of remarks. I am a Jewish convert from Christianity, and the question that you asked Dr. Gross to uh, Dr. Eisenman initially to repeat. Uh, Orthodox, conservative, and reformed, not reformed, but reformed Judaism view of Jesus, I think he did quite well as a secularist. If you look at Jacob Neusner's book, if you can't show it, you don't know it. And it's a direct reply to Geza Vermesh and to uh, E.P. Saunders and others. And uh, so he's really quite on the money. And he did quote the Pantera myth, <coughs> which is the Orthodox myth. And that is what the Orthodox say. And the Orthodox say you should not enter a church. And you should not even mention the word Yesu, which is one of the Talmudic words. So I think he did quite well. Romans 9 through 11, if you look at Becker, and Becker is in German and in English at the URL at UCLA. Those are an interpolation, those three chapters, Romans 9, excuse me, 9 through 11, as Philippians chapter 2 reads like an interpolation as well. Um, anyway, remarks to you. I think he did quite well. Um, that's all. Thank you. Well, I thank you for that. That's really kind of you to say. I didn't think I did extremely well, but I want to point one thing out that uh, in relation to this Jewish problem in Jews. Uh, this is young man is a convert to Judaism. Uh, Muzamil was talking about the synagogue, uh, the position flows out of, the, out of the synagogue. Most Jews I know don't go to synagogues. I think about 70% of Jews I know only go to a synagogue maybe once a year if they're lucky. Uh, you know, you can't speak about Jews in the same way as other faiths because it's not a unified whole. There's no central sort of organization body. Islam doesn't either have a central organization. When you speak about what Jews believe, I mean, it's almost impossible to uh, know because most of them disagree with each other. But I don't think anything flows out of the synagogue uh, for the average modern American Jew that is going to be authoritative for that person. Uh, can the panelists now address any of the specific questions that they have written, um, either capturing the flavor of them or any ones in particular? I can, I can answer a few of these if you'd like. Go ahead. Let me do go through mine first. This is exactly what someone was asked. Can you go into what the Jews for Jesus believe? Jesus Lord, Jesus Prophet, the Jews for Jesus believe everything Christians believe. They accept the Gospels literally the same way Christians, period. Uh, from the same person, how do the majority of Jews believe Jesus was killed? The answer, we first have to decide if there was an historical Jesus before we get on to the question of how and in what way he, he was killed. We know that a lot of revolutionary leaders were killed in Palestine. Uh, in this period, uh, like hundreds of thousands were crucified. If Jesus were one of these people, it wouldn't be surprising that he was crucified. But that's the scholarly position too, that basically what we're talking about is a Roman execution of subversives for revolutionary activity. Most of us think all of these people were involved in revolutionary activity against Rome in one way or another. That's not to beg the question, that's just to try to get into the historical Jesus. Uh, one or two other points. What seemed to fascinate people about what I was saying or bother them is this idea of literature versus history. So one of the persons asked me, if the Bible is considered just a piece of, of literature, wouldn't that make the Torah a piece of, of a literature too? Sure, sure, sure. You think I believe in Adam and Eve? You think I believe in Noah's Ark? You think I think that hundreds of thousands, uh, literally 500,000 species were in the Ark? You think I believe that Moses uh, threw down a stick and it turned into a snake? Uh, do you think I think he, 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 he tapped water and it came out of a rock? Of course, that is all miracleism. Those are all pious storytelling that appeals to a large population. But the academic-minded person, the serious intellectual of the modern 20th century, worries about all of those things. So it's not just one faith. We would cut across the board. Of course, the Bible is full of uh, uh, inaccuracies, inconsistencies, and in fact, maybe things that aren't even true. But there are some glorified things in it, too, which are very inspiring, as Dr. Gross said. So, you know, as a modern person, you have to pick and choose. And that's what I meant, uh, the person, what do you mean to say that literature is not part of um, history? Uh, 
I think that in some way Plato's writings are passed through in social sciences, etc., meaning that that is literal, uh, that they are used as literal history. So how can you deny these texts are part of literal history? It isn't that we deny any text as being part of history, it's the confusion of what the poets say. In ancient Greece, the poets said Zeus was a cloud gatherer threw lightning bolts down from clouds, had intercourse with human maidens, and did all this kind of thing. Well, this is poetic stuff. This is not history. And there's a lot of other things even in the Old Testament. Now, the most beautiful thing that Muslims said, and that the prophet is quoted as saying by the angel or the Holy Spirit or however you want to put it, is that he doesn't do miracles. That his miracle is the book. And if you don't like what he says, produce another surah like it. For any writer, that is the best argument of a great piece of literature I know. So in that, in that area, I would find myself very much in accord with the prophets and Islam's not wishing to verify anything uh, on the basis of throwing sticks down and turning them into snakes, or raising people from the dead, or walking on waters, or putting spirits in herds of swine and running them off mountaintops. That is the way the early world spoke. And I think in that sense, Islam is very modern. The caution for Islam is, don't make a miracle out of the Quran necessarily either, because when you do that, we can't speak about it in um, human terms. We have to have oil. And if we can't speak about it in human terms and have to have oil, then we can't study it in a university or as a historical document. And that makes it very difficult for us to even approach the Quran. So I think it should, that caution should go across the board. All of, not the Quran, which I think is a beautiful inspired document, but all of these things that are spoken of as uh, miracles must be taken with a grain of salt. Dr. Gross? Okay, just, just one comment on what Dr. Eisenman said. Um, all Christians do not take the Bible literally. And one illustration of that is simply we have four Gospels. There was um, what was called the Tesseron, a melding together of the Gospels, but it didn't last very long in the church. But we have four Gospels, and so there's no way to reconcile the four Gospels literally. They have the essential same themes, but uh, uh, one can't really defend. Uh, that undercuts any kind of fundamentalism, the simple fact that there are four Gospels, and the Church decided to keep four instead of one. Now then, um, the, one of the questions here that seems to strike me as important in, in this respect, um, I remember having lunch with Dr. John Hick, who was a noted scholar at Claremont Graduate School for a number of years. He's an English Presbyterian. Anyway, um, he had write, written the effect that the incarnation is, is poetic, is, is a poetic expression. Incarnation means in the flesh, and, and John's Gospel declares the Word became flesh, Jesus being the Word. Um, so, uh, Dr. Hick wanted to know what I thought about his thinking on it, <clears throat> and I said, well, it seems to me that what the Incarnation is telling us is that God came as a human being so that he could get under and lift because the situation is so bad that simply to address it from the outside is one thing, but to come and take hold and lift humanity is what the Incarnation is about. and, and uh, that flows into, contributes to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, which is a tri-unity, I might say. But anyway, uh, I don't want to elaborate too much on that. We have so much to do tonight. You all need to come and study with all three of us all the time, you know. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, first of all, the comment about um, modernism, being modern. If being modern means being a skeptic, if being modern means uh, not believing in anything real, uh, anti-realism, and of course uh, I don't subscribe to that kind of modernism. If being modern means to know what uh, various facts, study things, understand things, and know things uh, very critically, then it's okay. I do believe the Quran is the word of God. 
I do believe that Prophet Muhammad did not produce Quran. Prophet Muhammad received the Quran and he gave it. And I believe that everything in the Quran is truth, but I don't interpret it literally. I interpret many things of the Quran metaphorically. I and I interpret many things in the Quran uh, spiritually, but at the same time, I take every word of the Quran very seriously. And I believe that every every word of it came f as inspiration from God. And uh, that's what Muslim position is. But if somebody says that this is not modern position, it's up to the person's interpretation of what is modern. I don't subscribe to that interpretation of modern. Modern means living in the modern times, but doesn't mean to become a skeptic and become doubtful about the things. I don't believe in the miracles of God, and miracles did happen and miracles do happen. And at the same time, the, the miracles did, Jesus did perform miracles, Moses did perform miracles, Abraham performed miracles, Prophet Muhammad also performed miracles. His miracle was not only the Quran, he had many other miracles also. But he did emphasize that Quran is the word of God, and that is certainly the greatest miracle from God himself. Directly that came to the Prophet. Uh, now there are some other questions that came here, and I maybe can take few of them. Now first of all, one question is that uh, when Jesus is called the Messiah, uh, what does it mean? That means anointed one and anointed by whom and for what reason? The Muslim position is that Messiah means the blessed one. It is from the word Masaha as we do when we perform our wudu, we make Masaha every day. And that means we, we wipe our, our head through a wet hand and that's called Masaha. <coughs> and Jesus was in a sense was, uh, was touched with a special blessing, with a special favor. And this title, according to Islamic understanding, is that that is will be fulfilled by Jesus after his second coming. When he will come back again, and this is his uh, second coming role, in which he will bring the people together, and he fulfills certain rules of God on this earth. So that is the role, and in this, those who believe in Jesus, and those who consider him the Messiah, they will come together. So I, in that sense, Jews and uh, Christian community and the Muslim community, both of them consider Jesus the Messiah. And I think there will be a realization of the truth of Jesus and the coming together of that. So Messiah is recognized by Muslims and Christians both, it is Jesus. And Muslims, are, on this point, there is no doubt on that. There is no question about that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, when somebody asks this question, what does it mean that Jesus is uh, superior to Prophet Muhammad because of this? Peace be upon him or peace be upon both of them? We don't talk, talk that way. Islam forbids us to make one prophet superior over another prophet. This language is not to be used. Each prophet has his function, his mission to fulfill that. Jesus has his function, Prophet Muhammad has his function, other prophets of God has his function. But it's not right to put one prophet over the other and say he is better than the other prophet. This is a, a kind of uh, disrespect to the prophets of God. <coughs> prophet Muhammad also had great functions. He is the last prophet of God, there is no prophet after him. God made him the prophet for all the people of the world. He is capital in us. And this is of course the great honor that was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That there, is, there was no prophet before him who was for all people, for the whole humanity. Prophet Muhammad according to our belief is for the whole humanity. So in that sense you can say that this is another important function of the Prophet ﷺ. But it is not right for Muslims to speak and say our prophet is better than your prophet. That will be wrong thing. It happened in the time of the Prophet himself. Somebody said, in an argument with uh, somebody who believed in, uh, in the Jonah, Jonah of Nineveh. And there was some kind of argument and he said our prophet was better than Jonah because Jonah escaped the city, he went away, he ran away. So our prophet did not run away, the prophet stayed until the, uh, the God's command came to make the hijrah, then he made the hijrah. And the prophet when he heard that, he rebuked that person, he said no. La tufaddaluni ala Yunus ibn Matta. Don't even call me that I am better than Yunus ibn Matta. He was my, my brother, he was the messenger of God. And don't disuse this kind of language of one prophet superior than the other prophet. But generally you can say that. Generally yes. Tilka rusul faddalna ba'dhum ala ba'd. Some messengers were above the other messengers. And in that sense Muslims say that he is the fi final of the Prophet, the last of the messenger of, about Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Another question was about uh, uh, the anti-Semitism. Mentioned that is there any anti-Semitism in Islam? 
Absolutely not. Islam itself is the Semitic religion. Hmm. Uh, if you, I mean, if you take away some of the differences, you'll find the Jews and Arabs, same people, same race, same, same group of people. Same uh, even, even the language is very similar. And many things are to, so Islam cannot be anti-Semitic. Uh, some of the problems that have come recently, they have come because of the political issues. Oh. And if these political issues, if they are taken away, if there is more recognition, more rights are given to the Palestinian people and justice and peace established, you will see that both communities can work together and they live together. I think it was uh, in the history, Jews and Muslims lived together and very close to each other. Spain is the golden period when the Jewish community and the Muslim community lived together. And in many other places in the world, whenever there was persecution of, of Jews in Europe, they found its refuge in the Muslim land, in the Ottoman land, in many other places.